Jeff, may I call you Jeff? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Golf is the, th- the only thing in golf that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the person playing. Is this man a one-time winner on the PGA Tour? The point, Alan, is he didn't go Hollywood. You need a fourth? This is fun. So let's say you're probably a better guitar player than I am a golfer. I think it's the reason so many athletes across sports think he's the greatest athlete they ever saw. I would go to the range and I would try to hit, you know, a couple of hundred one irons. And I would try to hit them as high and as hard as I could. Great athletes do leave legacies. I'm trying to think of the one I could share and not get myself in trouble. Oh my God, there's a dangerous group here. (laughs) So I think we can all agree that Echo Golf Shoes changed the game when Fred Couples rolled up wearing them without socks. It it, it spoke to their comfort and just sort of that that effortless cool. But you have an Arnold Palmer story I want to hear, right? Let's hear it, Mike. Have I ever told you about my last visit with Arnold? I I saw Arnold. I would like to thank no reporters for Arnold more than I did uh, when he was in his 80s. My last visit with him was in La Trobe, and I drove there wearing these pathetic Birkenstocks. When I got, oh, I'll just wear my shoes when I get there. But when I got there, all I had was my Echo golf shoes, and Arnold's really formal. And I'm going into his office with my cleaned up Echo golf shoes. And Arnold's like checking me out and he's nodding. And I said, Arnold, are you looking at my socks? And he's, Arnold's like, no, I'm looking at your shoes. And then Arnold talked about all the different shoes he wore. And no question, Arnold dug the Echo shoe. I love the Echo shoe. I know you do too. Uh, it's a great shoe. If and I'm good- sales resistant. <laughs> if it's good enough for Arnold Palmer and Fred Couples, it's good enough for the rest of you. So go to echo.com and um, you can find one that fits, that you like, that people will stare at, like Arnie. So back to Need a Fourth. Hello, this is Alan Shipnuck, back for another edition of Need a Fourth, the podcast where myself, Jeff Ogilvy, and Michael Bamberger take turns surprising each other with a surprise mystery guest. That actually might be redundant. But anyway, <laughs> they don't know who's who's waiting in the waiting room. I do. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of hints. Um Michael, this will interest you. It's not going to help you guess. It's so esoteric. But his father founded People Magazine. So uh, came up in the typing trade. Uh, this gentleman is not a professional golfer, He's, uh, but he's one of the most enthusiastic, avid golfers I know. If you follow him on social media, and a million people do just on Twitter, you know, he's often teeing it up somewhere uh, fancy or, or not so fancy. He's, he's, a, he's a man of the people as well. Um, he can talk about football the way that we can talk about golf. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, his uh, his given name is a mystery to many, uh, but he has a, a Roman numeral three at the end of his full name, much like Davis Love the Third, who many people refer to as Trip. Not loud and Wayne. Not loud and Wainwright the Third. I don't know him, but I'd like to. Oh, but, Jeff does. He's a musician, and his and his grandfather did work for Time Inc., but did not found People magazines. Okay, so it's not tr- it's not trip, but it's of that genre. It's one of the great names in 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 the sports media galaxy. It's one of your buddies from Carmel. Who? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not one of your buddies. <laughs> not a Carmel guy. I'm totally lost. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna put you out of your misery. Let's let's bring in from the waiting room Trey Wingo. Oh, Trey Wingo. Mr. Wingo, oh. are you there? Ah, there he is. Hello, sir. How are you? You talking to me? <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, right. no, nobody calls me sir. I'm doing great, Alan. How are you, man? <laughs> awesome. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, you know, this this is a golfy podcast. Uh, we have many people who are deep in the game and, and the golf media and they're, they're professional golfers and that sort of stuff. But I think you're one of the most avid amateurs I know. I thought it'd be fun to get your take on, on many things. Uh, tell, tell the listeners and the co host about your, your love for the sport because they may not know how deep it runs in your veins here. Yeah, it's pretty pathetically deep, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, <laughs> I never played a lot when I was a kid. Um, just, you know, screwing around here or there. And then I, uh, got into it a little bit in my, in my twenties. Uh, and, uh, I, I fell in love with golf at watching the war at the shore, the 1991 Ryder cup. I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And to this day, um, honestly, the Ryder cup is my favorite sporting event of all time. Uh, 
Uh, you know, it's the only sport, it's the only event I know where millionaires play for free, you know, and uh, <laughs> they, they play for the pride. And uh, uh, it just it's it's awesome. So, yeah, I, I love the game, even though the game doesn't love me back a lot. But uh, I, I, uh, I enjoy I enjoy the adventure of it. Like, I, I think if I was really good at it, it might not be as enjoyable. I know that sounds crazy, but like <laughs> the maddening part of it where you can go out and play like you finally figured it out. And then the next time you step on a golf course, it's like you're holding a snow shovel in your hands and not a driver. And I think that's the part of it that drives me a little crazy, but it also makes it fun. Well, I think we can all agree, probably the baddest mofo who has ever walked the planet is uh, Jim Brown, the former NFL running back. And he once cited his favorite sporting event to be the Ryder Cup for all the reasons you laid out. And so uh, I'm curious, as, as you travel through the NFL universe, how, is, is golf a universal language? And do you find yourself having these these deep discussions with the guys that have nothing to do with the football, but it's more about the game you both love? Oh, absolutely. And, and you see more and more of these guys picking up golf, uh, especially in the off season. You know, Patrick Mahomes, when he was at Lake Tahoe a year ago, says, I'm coming for you, Marty. And I'm like, yeah, you, you need to relax. Marty Fish might be the best non-professional golfer I've ever played with in my life. Like, Marty is so incredibly good. Like, I think if he didn't, if he wasn't going to be a pro tennis player, he could have been a pro golfer. But yeah, there are there are so many guys in the NFL that are so into golf. It's what they do a lot in the off season. So it is absolutely, like you said, a universal language. You know, when, when you get a bunch of quarterbacks together, uh, after they talk about spirals and all that kind of stuff, you know, they start doing this and, you know, they go, what am I, what am I, am I closing too soon? You know, they go, they go through all the machinations that all of us do. Trey, uh, have you ever played with John Smoltz by any chance? Because he would be my leader in the, in the clubhouse in that exact specific category that you just mentioned. No, Smoltzy, like that whole brave staff of the 90s, like Steve Avery, uh, Glavin, Maddox, they all played golf, but Smoltz was by far the best. My, my favorite, my best John Smoltz story of all time is that when my son was younger, he's 27 now, we used to go down to Disney World every year for his birthday, and uh, I ran into Smoltz at one of those water parks. I can't remember uh, this, uh, which one it was, one of those two water parks at Disney World. He was there with his kids on vacation, and I was there with my kids uh, taking them down for a birthday celebration. And we were, you know, we, we were being the dorky dads at the water park at, at Disney World. I was like, that is you, right? Like, yeah, we're, we're just here sort of messing around with the kids. So my, my summer job when I was in college, I was a cart boy at Pebble Beach Golf Links. And not terrible. Not terrible. I mean, that's where I really learned to play the game, which is what I say is like, you know, losing your virginity to Jennifer Lawrence. It's, it's all downhill from there. And, um, the head pro said, hey, run up to the driving range and pick some guys up. I said, I, I just did a sweep. There's nobody there. He's like, just go up there and wait around. I was like, okay. And so all of a sudden, this helicopter touches down and disgorges the entire Atlanta Braves pitching staff. Yeah. They, they had like a night game up at, uh, against the Giants at Candlestick Park, and they all helicopter down. They played pebble, and they took off. I thought that was like the most macho thing I've ever seen. Membership has its privileges, I think, is, is the, uh, the saying on the American Express card. Can, may I ask Jeff a question related to this subject? Jeff, you'll see elite athletes uh, like we're speaking of here, um, uh, Fish and, and Smoltz and, uh, and others. And uh, Michael, Mike Schmidt, the uh, former third baseman for the Phillies, I would say in this category, was in this category. John Brody was in this category. John Brody. They, they look like the real deal until you get to about 80 yards and in. And I wonder why that is. What? Why can't a really elite athlete figure out 80 yards and in like you guys can? Well, they look like the real deal to you, I guess. Um, <laughs> wow, brutal! Coming in with a coming <laughs> in with high heat right away, like chin music right away to the to the elite athletes. You can see. I mean, I've played with Romo a few times. I used to play with Derek Anderson. Like the, he was a backup. He played at Cleveland for a long time, backup behind um, Cam Newton and. Carolina. The great Scapusian. He was a really, really good player. Um, they're so talented. They're such good athletes, especially the throwing athletes, like you say, the pitchers, the baseballers, the quarterbacks. Um, they can find the ball from spots where most people couldn't find the ball. You know, they can make something that isn't really that great work. But you can't really – short game, I think, is – pros, we all grew up around a chipping green, you know, and putting and chipping around the house with plastic balls and – there's such an innate sort of undescribable feeling to it that you just you can't just be a great athlete and be a good have a good short game. 
you know, you've got to actually learn the craft. I guess it's like art or like drawing or I mean, some, playing music, play a musical instrument. You can't just sort of play the right notes. You know, you've got to actually get involved and I think you've got to do it for a long time and I think that too and they're too strong. I mean, they're massive athletes, these guys, and they spend their whole time pushing weights as hard as they can and hitting guys as hard as they can. That's not what you do in a short game, right? So, um, I mean, they get there. I mean, eventually when they play a lot, you see them retire from their sport and just focus on golf and they get better and better and better. But um, short game just takes time. I think a good athlete can hit a ball pretty quickly because they're just talented. But short game is a, is a craft and you can't just paint by numbers. You've got to learn it. Well, I mean, the corollary to that, Michael, is that if you go to a, a corn ferry event or a Latino America event on the driving range, all these guys look like tour players. And then you go to the practice putting green and you see all the weird contraptions and the funky strokes and, you know, guys are tearing their hair out. So, I mean, even even elite golfers who have been playing golf their whole life, the short game is the separator, right? I got a, I got a great story that I got to share there uh, of a buddy of mine who's a member at uh, Royal Oak in, in, in Dallas. And uh, they had some guy that was uh, trying to make a, a tour stop there, down there, all hitting on the range. And this guy was like striping everything, right? He was hitting, you know, high fades, low draws, whatever, I mean, everything, you could, every shot you could possibly imagine. And this local caddy came up to him and said, man, you must not be able to putt or chip worth a damn. He's like, why do you say that? Because because if you did, I'd sure as hell know who you are. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. A quick follow-up to Jeff's point uh, when he says, you know, they look to me like they might be pretty good. I was one. One year, Watson missed the cut. Uh, of course, he missed the cut a lot uh, in the last 10 or 15 Masters. But he was on the range on Saturday afternoon because he had a senior event the next week. And he said it great. And I'm, I'm the only person in the stands, and Watson's the only person on the practice seat. And uh, so when he was done, uh, he said, Tom, it looks pretty good. He said, you think so? I said, yeah, it looked good to me. He said, that session sucked. I said, really? I thought it looked good. I said, I thought it looked good. He said, that's because you're a chop. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> more high heat damn uh i have to tell one more pebble beach story just because it's so funny that um the national hockey league players association had some big boondoggle out there and all these dudes rolled up this again this is early 90s and they it's like nine in the morning and these guys had already been boozing you could just tell and so I, maybe a couple dozen of them ring the first tee and jeremy ronick if you remember that guy he was he was a great hockey player and uh he's on the first tee and he pulls out his driver and of course you guys know pebble beach first hole is this very short gentle dog leg par four i mean it's a hybrid or it's a for jeff it's probably a three iron or whatever and he's got his driver the caddy's like you know sir I, I that's too much club uh he's like well i'll try it i'll try and just say i cut the corner it's like, oh, okay and so he hit one dead straight and it flew the bunker it flew the tree and it almost hit the house, which is so far up the hill. I never even thought it was in play. And all these other hockey guys like literally fell down laughing. It was pandemonium. It was like, well, this is going to be a very sloppy day at Pebble Beach. Well, I'll tell you a great Jeremy Ronick story from Pebble Beach. I was playing in a charity tournament there about seven, eight years ago. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a charity event at Pebble Beach. It's going to be slow anyway, right? Ronick just decided because he's Jeremy Ronick. Hey, the guys in front of me, I know you guys. Let's play as an eightsome. So we're behind him. We're now playing behind Jeremy Roenick on Pebble Beach, and he's playing an eightsome. He was that guy. He was that guy. <laughs> and I'm sure you said nothing, right? Oh, I was at, I was, uh, I was, it was, uh, I was the host that night, and I gave a speech, and I made sure I pointed out that he was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, uh, I mean, Trey, you, you do get to travel around and, and play a lot of great places, as do Michael and I, and obviously Jeff as well. Let, let's hear, let's hear your favorites, and we're, we're going to critique your list. So be prepared. Oh, well, all right, this is, this is, uh, I got to come strong here now. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I'm very fortunate to have played a lot of places that I really enjoy and a lot of great places that a lot of people want to play. But I got to say, uh, Cabot is about as uh, special as it gets um, up there at, uh, in, in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, Cabot Cliffs is, uh, is just, a, uh, just a remarkable golf course. Uh, it's 6-6-6, six, 6-3, six, and 6-4s, six, 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 and 6-5s. Six uh, which I think is really fun. And almost every hole has a stunning view of the ocean. Almost every hole is so incredibly unique. Uh, Cabot, and then the Lynx course is great too. It's just a pure Lynx course right by the water, but the Cliffs course is more dramatic. 
with the with, you know with sixteen and seventeen right along the water there. I mean, eighteen is as well, but literally sixteen is a par three over the Gulch. So that would be way up there. Uh, it used to be the challenge at Manelli. Now it's called Lanai Golf. Uh, that's one of my favorite courses I've ever played. Bill Gates got married on the twelfth green there. Uh, <laughs> in a true flex of fu money, uh, he grounded every single private aviation on all the Hawaiian islands, helicopters, airplanes, everywhere around. So nobody could take off and fly over and take pictures of his wedding on the 12th green at Manelli. I mean, that's that's the ultimate financial flex that I could think of. Memo to Bill Gates. We don't care. Nobody really wants those photos, Bill. You're not Tiger Woods at Sandy Lane. Come on. Like, yeah, that's true. That's fair. But he did it anyway. Like I just I just respected the flex, like the entire fleet of all the... You'd have to come from Seattle or LA if you wanted to film my... Uh, filmed my wedding. So I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Just got back from Piners, played the Dormy Club for the first time, which was really, really fun. Uh, that was a, I, you know, they just, that whole Dormy Network is starting up and we played the Dormy Club, which is five, 10 minutes outside of Pinehurst. That was a really, really special experience. Have you played Tobacco Road? I have not. In fact, we were debating. Uh, uh. Said, no, see, no, hold on, hold on now, hold on. We were debating whether or not we were going to go because we we had this one extra day. We were either going to go to Tobacco Road or the Dormy Club. And so we decided to go to the Dormy Club. And uh, next time, I promise you, we will hit Tobacco Road because that, that was the other option. You chose poorly. But I mean, Tobacco Road to me, and it, unfortunately, everyone's discovered it and it's become it's become very trendy. But I, I'm a Mike Strantz guy. I wrote a big story about it for, for Golf Magazine years ago. And that to me is the wildest golf course ever made by God or man. And I absolutely love it. So it's too polarizing for Michael would probably hate it. But well, that's the thing. Uh, I, that's why I've heard every, you either love Tobacco Road or you hate it. So, Michael, where are you on that one? I haven't been, uh, but I'm sure Alan will get me there before before too long. Trey, may I ask you a quick question about the "gonna need a bigger boat" sign behind your head? It, now that, of course, is a reference to Jaws, as I know. But it, is, does it refer to the movie, or is it some other reference for you? No, that's a yeah. No, we uh, we got in uh, Chatham, Massachusetts, up in Cape Cod, and of course they filmed the uh, they filmed the movie Jaws off Martha's Vineyard. So yeah, that's absolutely an homage to Jaws the movie. Gonna need a bigger boat. That is a deeply accurate comment when you say off Martha's Vineyard, because a lot of it was aquatic. Uh, yeah. But many of the scenes were shot in uh, the village of Edgartown. I, it's it's cl- it's dear to me because my first newspaper job was on the Vineyard Gazette of Martha's Vineyard. And uh, so some of the extras, a lot of the extras in that movie were people that I knew. Uh, my country doctor was the country doctor in the movie. Sheriff Huck Look was in the, uh, and there's a wonderful uh, golf course that I recommend to any of you um, if you can get over there. Uh, it's a nine hole. It's a little hard to get onto, but I think Jeff would be able to. I don't know about the the other the others of us. Um, it's called the Egertown Golf Club. It's a nine hole. Sure. It's back to about 18, yeah. 1890, I would think. And uh, really tiny greens and tiny bunkers with big lips, and it moves and it's sandy. It's really a gem. There's a great little uh, uh, nine hole golf course. I, I think it's called, uh, I can't remember what it's called. I, I, they just, uh, it's up in Truro, Mass. And uh, it's actually, you, you can play it as 18, but it's just using different tees. But it's nine holes right across the, right next to the National Seashore right there. Now, obviously, uh, it's a public course. They don't have the money to keep it up. But, but the layout is absolutely fantastic. And it's got some really great holes right along the National Seashore there. You know what's so funny about this conversation is they just re-released Jaws on the big screen in 3D. And I took my 14-year-old son and three of his buddies on uh, Friday night. And they, they kind of knew what it was, but they didn't really know. And they were riveted because it's yeah. it's very much a psychological, uh, suspenseful movie. It's not just people getting chewed up and spit out like any modern take on the movie would be. And they were super into it. So. Well, yeah, you you didn't see the shark until like 60, 70 minutes into the movie. Great point. Yeah, exactly. Jeff, did you, was Jaws a, mo- a big movie in, in Australia? Uh, are you kidding? Jaws so. was a Tuesday in Australia. I mean, that's, <laughs> just, that's a day that ends in Y. Uh, yeah, we got some sharks. But you obviously love the movie because you've thought about your studio set up there. <laughs> and you've chosen Jaws as the, the main theme to your studio. So, well done. Um, yeah, sharks are... It's just part of being an Australian, really. Like, they're just fish. Just giant, enormous fish that will kill you. What Jaws did do is it stopped Australian tourism for a while. I think if the Australian Tourism Board 
even though the shark was in the US, everyone everyone you meet around the world, it's like, oh, I'd love to go to Australia, but you've got sharks and snakes and spiders. I don't want to go down there. It's too scary. <laughs> yeah, but you've got Royal <laughs> you've got Royal Melbourne too, so that's yeah. safe. Well, I, I, I did play I did play New South Wales a few years ago. That was Oh, that's awesome. That was that's a tremendous love that's golf a course. Play, that was yeah. a, that was a special day. Uh, but it is funny you say that, Jeff, because I know somebody that went to Australia recently and said, You're gonna get in the water? And they're like, I'm not gonna get in the water, there are sharks there. I'm like Okay, come on now. <laughs> like you, you know, it's it's not like everybody that jumps in the water in Australia and you know, there's a neon sign around their their neck that says "Eat me." You know, it's not it's not quite that <laughs> simple. You really have to have some bad luck to be eaten by a eaten by a shark in somewhere in Australia, unless you're unless you're near Rotten Nest Island. Yeah, they're very territorial. Yeah, Western Australia is rough. Um, I mean, it's like it'd be like getting bitten by a rattlesnake in. Manhattan, like it just doesn't happen. If you go where there's no sharks, you don't get bitten by a shark. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Um, Jeff, I, when I played New South Wales, it absolutely blew my mind. I thought it was maybe the most spectacular and possibly the hardest golf course I ever played off the tee. Just felt like every hole you were standing there and you had to hit it over a hill and thread it between this and that. And like, I mean, I love the challenge. I wasn't totally up to it, but it was just. I thought what is an absolutely incredible championship course. It's not one that gets discussed like Royal Melbourne or Kingston Heath. I mean, what what is your feelings about uh, about New South Wales? Oh, I think it's incredible. Yeah, it's. I mean, it depends on the day you play. I mean, you probably played windy days when you were playing there. It's generally windy. Uh, it's it's incredible. It's a little bit uh, fiddly, I think, for us now. How far we hit it? There's a couple of holes you got to sort of take some really weird, crazy lines on because oh. the kind of technology's grown out of it. For professionals probably um and we've had some australian opens there we had one we had a wind delay and stuff so there's like sort of logistic issues to that um but it's an incredible place when you play the first few holes you're like this place is pretty good and you come over the whole either the hill on five and you just see the whole thing in the ocean and all that it's just like what a sort of delayed reveal to the day you know and then you hang along the ocean you go back in and you go back towards the ocean and it's a little bit like pebble, like that delayed reveal when you walk off the fourth tee and you sort of get past the structure and all of a sudden it's all there in front of you. It's, um, yeah, New South Wales is untalked about. I mean, Mackenzie went there too. He had a bit of an influence there. Um, I don't know. I think the sand belt just gets the, just gets the credit so much because of Royal Melbourne and Kingston Heath and the supporting cast, I think. Um, and there's that Melbourne, Sydney sort of thing, which is a bit like uh, New York, Boston sort of thing going on that we don't talk about Sydney where we're in Melbourne. They're not relevant in a golf sense, you know. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, New South Wales is fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, another one I played when I was over there was Hamilton Island. Now, that was a funky mm. golf course. Like, that the, is outrageous. I mean, it, it, the, only, the only thing on the island is the golf course and the pro shop. Like, there's nothing else on the it's, – it's not even on Hamilton Island. It's on a separate – you take a ferry from Hamilton Island across this channel to get to the island where the golf course is. And – like the drive from the 17th green to the 18th tee, I swear to God, it took 10, 15 minutes in the golf cart. Like, <laughs> it, like there's nothing else on this island. It was, I, I was like, am I lost? Is, is, am I being punked? It took that long, but it was, it was a really interesting layout over there. How many did, balls did you lose? Uh, more than I care to talk about on this podcast. <laughs> they, um, <laughs> tourists will come over you catch the boat from hamilton island the main island and you get a little boat across the golf course and like trey says it's the only it's the only thing on the island and um they'll ask you how many balls you've got and if you only have a dozen balls and like well you better buy a couple more dozen because yeah. you're going to be coming back and with some more and there's um i know there's stories about four five six seven dozen balls people coming in after six holes to get more balls it's like if you miss the fairway you've lost well, and they, um, they also have this sign up that says, do not go look for your ball because every poisonous thing you can possibly think of exists on this island. So do not go into the weeds. No humans, lots of snakes. Yeah. Trey, did you get to, um, to King Island? Uh, you know, it's kind of halfway between Melbourne and Tassie. No, I didn't. And the, the, one, uh, the one thing, the white whale on my list right now is Terry Eady. Like I, I need to yeah. find a way to get to. Now, I know there's a bunch of great golf courses in New Zealand. I understand that. But, uh, you know, I've seen a couple of videos of Terry Eady and it just looks incredible. So I've got to I've got to figure out that's that's the next one on the on the checklist. I've got to find a way to get to Terry Eady. Yeah. Well, you know, it's 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 only 45 minutes from the Auckland airport. So it's quite accessible once once you get to the 
to New Zealand. Now, if you want to get to Cape it's Kidnappers. It's just the getting to New Zealand part. Oh, right? yeah, there's exactly. just that part. Like, just that part. <laughs> that's the hard part. I mean, like from yeah. Auckland, it's not a problem. It's the going from the United States <laughs> to New Zealand is the issue. Yeah, okay, that's the issue. But you should at this point, you should wait another year or two because they're building two more courses right, there. exactly. And yeah. Um, yeah. That I would say, what, Seven Mile Beach, that's um, that's a Mike Clayton production, isn't it, Jeff? Like, that's, mm-hmm. Yeah, in Tasmania. Uh, yeah, it's worth yeah. waiting probably a, a year or so because there's a couple more coming along. You could do an unbelievable sort of coastal golf course tour down here. Um, Taridi is definitely worth it. I, I feel like there's probably a couple of footballers who are members. Of, it's very lots of American members at Taridi. I'm sure you could find your way in there. Trade. Well, that's the beauty of it. I mean, they say like they realize how special the place is that – if you just get a letter from your club, you can go over there and play. Because, like I said, you're not going to get over there very often. So uh, th- they do allow you to play, but only once. Trey, you can only play once. So, like, right. we're we're sort of kicking ourselves because we went over and played it a couple years ago, and it was phenomenal. But now these these other ones are coming online, which will be public. So they're they're but they're the original Tar Edie, They say is going to be like our Cypress Point, and these next two will be like our Pebble and our Spyglass. So right. that's super cool. Um, but yeah, we've... it's all right. I know some members. I'll get you on. Okay, that's I, well, that's no, a I'll verbal say... commitment. That's a contract. <laughs> that is a verbal contract from Jeff Ogilvy, and I'm holding him to it. Um, I played North Berwick yeah, a few years ago. That was pretty special too. In Gullen, that oh, was man. A, that was a cool it's, golf course. It's top five in my list, Jeff. Let's let's hear yours. Not to put you on the spot, but you are not only uh, a better golfer than the three of us. You are of a very refined eye, and you actually build golf courses. So. I've never asked you what, what your your favorite courses are. I could probably guess, but l- let me hear it from you. Um, well, you I don't know. Uh, it's so subjective, right? Like these golf course ranking lists are so ridiculous. Um, there's no such thing as the best golf course. Um, no, I didn't say best. I just said favorite because that's a little no, different. No, I'm just putting some uh, – I don't want anyone to hold me to any lists. This is not a ranking. Um, yeah. My favorite place to play in the world or well, the places that I've had – enjoyed my game of golf the most number one is swinley forest um just west of london um near sunningdale it was harry colt who did all those sort of heathland courses in london um had a lot to do with pine valley and he called it in his book his least bad course (laughs) (laughs) which i thought was a cool description very humble man um fantastic place it's like a mini pine valley it's like really small it's probably only might not even be 6,000 yards, um, way too small. But to go out with a little half set and a little leather carry bag and walk along with your Cocker Spaniel, it's like just the perfect golf experience for me. Um, that's the red, That's the one off to the side. I think Pine Valley is an incredible golf experience. Um, you, go with a, you go with your boys, you go stay overnight. It's, it's the whole experience of Pine Valley. The course is really great. I think it's probably not very democratic because I think unless you're a, good, a really good player, I think you're going to find it too hard. Um, it's so visually intimidating though, right? Like for, for example, the second hole of Pine Valley, there's just all this shit on the left side, all the shit on the right side, but the fairway's 50 yards wide, but in your eye, all you see is, well, I can't hit it here. I can't hit it here. You know? Yeah, it's tough and you got to be long. And so that's, it, it's clearly an unbelievable achievement in building a golf course, um, Pine Valley. And it's amazing. Look, I mean, Shinnecock national, the whole, sort of Southampton area is incredible. Um, Carmel, obviously, Cyprus. Cyprus is one of my favorites. Um, I love golf in the Carolinas in general, like the Pinehurst area. There's so many good golf courses around there. But the old course, probably, if you gave me one course to play for the rest of my life, it would have to be the old course. I just think it's better every time I play it, even though I've played it 50 or 60 times probably. Um, It's why golf is a sport. Like North Berwick's along there with it. Um, Presswick's along there with it but I think the old course if you just look at it from every single angle where we talked about it around the open and stuff a lot but it's why the sport is the sport and it's why it's such a so great such a great sport and it's been so enduring I think if it did, if it started a different way um, golf would look very different but it, it was that old thing if if you, you just change the direction of something right at the beginning it makes a big difference at the end golf, St Andrews pointed us off in a pretty good direction and I just love the town and uh you could live there two or three months a year and just play there every morning and be pretty happy. What do you th- what do you think about Kings Barnes? Just out of curiosity, it's a, it's a it's Kings Barnes is great. I think yeah. it was um, 
a hundred years old, people would probably give it a bit more respect. Right. Um, it only, it, but it feels like it's been around for 150 years. I mean, the, when you walk on that golf course and you say it was open in 2000, it's hard to believe. It really is because usually the new links just leave you like, mm, you know, like it's just a bit, they're trying a bit too hard. Um, Kings Barnes, yeah, they nailed it there. That's really cool. It's a really cool property the way I kind of like the two loops. You go out and back, then out and back and um, clubhouse in the middle. Yeah, it's stunning views, incredible views up on the hill. Quite a dramatic land for Lynx course, yeah. Kings Barnes is really, really cool for a new one. Note that I'm not asking Michael for his list of favorite golf courses because they'd be all these esoteric munis that none of us ever heard of. So we, we don't even need to go I down the old course is up on his list. Yeah, I think the old course is up on his list too. But that's all that is a muni course in fairness. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> well, it is the muni course in fairness. <laughs> Alan, I appreciate your uh, your insight and it's it's an accurate one. But also, I refuse to participate in a discussion when there's any of the panelists refer to. H.S. Henry Colt as Harry. They're already in such a league <laughs> beyond me. I didn't even know. I didn't even know a living person could call King Harry. So I'm out. <laughs> That's totally fair. Um, you know, Trey. One thing I was thinking about when, when uh, looking looking forward to this conversation is. As you know, this is a time of great upheaval in the professional golf uh, landscape. And a parallel that gets made a lot is between the USFL, its its uh, its founding and trying to trying to siphon away talent from the NFL. Uh, I I need to read Jeff Perlman's book and do a little more research on the whole topic. But what is your take on on that era as, as as a scholar of of football? What can we what can we learn from the demise of the USFL and how can you extrapolate all this to to live golf in the PGA Tour. Well, without getting too political, Donald Trump was involved in both of them. So, uh, yep. you know, you know, Trump Trump's big move for the USFL was let's go up against them in the fall. And it turned out to be an absolute disaster. Um, they won the lawsuit for a dollar. You know, congratulations. You won three bucks because it was an anti-lawsuit and you got it troubled. So big win. <laughs> huge. Um, look, <laughs> no, I, no, it, it's pronounced huge, 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 huge. huge. Uh, here, here's look. If you want to go play in the live tour, fine. If you want to enjoy it, fine. But like, I, I guess I would say, I, I, I don't think it had to be this way. Like, I, I never understood the tour sort of going to the mattresses mantra here, right? Like, to me, uneasy peace is always better than all out war. And, you know, Jay Monahan and everybody tried to shame people into staying. And that didn't work. And then they tried to penalize people for leaving. That didn't work. Uh, and for all the stuff that, you know, as you well know, Alan, uh, Phil got in trouble for, you know, it's amazing that when this live tour started uh, happening, a lot of things that a lot of players wanted to change on tour miraculously happened. You know, it's like, well, we found $80 million. We don't know where this was from. And hey, let's do this and do that. So whether or not you like or don't like the live tour, that's fine. That's your perspective. But I think it did force the PGA tour to change. And I don't think that's going to be a bad thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I appreciate, you know, you we're all in our little bubbles and echo chambers. So you just yeah. speak for kind of a hardcore golf fan. So that that's an interesting perspective, but I mean, what is the legacy of the Uf USFL? Did it, did it change football in any way? No, no, the NFL squashed it. I mean, there, there weren't, there weren't any innovations, you know, there weren't any, uh, there weren't things that it was just another opportunity for place people to go. And like, you know, great, great players like Reggie White started out in the USFL. Steve Young, my high school quarterback, started out uh, in the USFL. Like when he got a 40 million dollar contract, uh, you know, uh, in 1983, that was unheard of. Of course, Steve would always say, yeah, but it was paid out over 40 years, you know, and he never saw any of that money. Um, the, I guess the difference there is on the live tour, it's all up front. Right. They're, they're throwing it all up front. I do find it interesting, too, that whenever Live Golf is marketing this stuff and they put stuff out on social media, it's almost never about the golf. It's about a party. It's about look at this great food. You know, it's about I don't quite understand that. If you're trying to draw me in with the golf, why are you putting everything on social media about lobster tails and champagne? That's the part I can't quite figure out. Trey, the, the way sport, the direction, the, the way sports broadcasting is going. Is it possible that you could have a sports league, a very narrow sports league like Live Golf, and have it be successful only as a YouTube channel? And I say that having actually watched some of 
I shouldn't use the word actually, but having watched some of the um, broadcast y- yesterday of the uh, of the Boston event, and yeah. it was good. I was surprised how good yeah. it was. Well, it, listen, it's it's it, it is good, right? I mean, and I think one of the things that we like about it is the thing that that it speaks to what you're just talking about. There are no commercials. It's constant action. If they do get a television network deal, which I think they will, um, that will change. You know, like everybody is up in arms about the playing through stuff, uh, you know, when we go through on the Golf Channel or on NBC. Well, it's just constant action on the Live Tour. And one of the reasons it's constant action is because they don't have to throw to any commercials. And remember, you know, people are like, well, how can this survive as a business entity? That's not the point. I mean, they're not trying to build a successful business. They're trying to establish a brand and they have unlimited funds in which to do so. So, you know, like, can it sustain this way? Yeah, they can sustain it as long as they friggin' want to because they have more money than they know what to do with. Um, there, there are parts of the live thing that I don't have. Yeah, I think are fun. Like the, I like the idea of the shotgun star. You look, especially the Scottish Open this year, the difference I think in the, in the early to late and late to early window with the first couple of days was a dramatic difference in scoring. So that part I understand. I, I think a lot of players like the team concept part of it. Um, I know Pat Perez does. Uh, you know, goes <laughs> out there, shoots, <laughs> shoots an 80 yeah. and yeah. makes a ton of money. Um, so th- there are parts of it I think that are interesting and and are 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 fascinating to watch. You know, and that what that TGL thing that the that the PGA Tour is going to do, that's basically top golf. Alan, we're gonna Alan, we're gonna have to have a golf off. Uh, between Trey and uh, and and Jeff, and uh, because these two guys know more golf than you and I and Jeff together, not Jeff Ogilvy. Um, pardon me, Alan. Just having a moment here. Uh, J- Jeff, the, <laughs> the former legal analyst, Jeff Tubin. No, Jeff Tubin. Jeff Tubin. Our, our so Jeffrey Tubin. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, you, yeah. Trey, we had Jeff Tubin on recently. I'm sure you know the name. You may not know, sure. him. but he is also really, really passionate golf fan. And follows it as deeply as you do. The fact that you know about the weather shift at the Scottish Open actually <laughs> freaks me out. But that's okay. <laughs> well, it's a true thing, though. I mean, like, you know, especially in the Open, and Jeff will attest to this, where you are in the weather draw half the time makes up whether or not you're going to be around uh, in atop of the leaderboard. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what's great about it? Yes, you're 100 percent right. You're 100. I mean, like Sergio used to complain about that all the time. You know, like I remember the 2002 U.S. Open at Bethpage when it was raining so hard, and Sergio actually said, "Well, it was Tiger out there; they would have stopped it." You know, it's like, all right, just waggle some more and move on. You know what I mean? That's when he <laughs> that's when he couldn't pull the trigger. You know, he's just doing this 150 <laughs> times, and the folks at Bethpage were getting on him. So, uh, look, the Live Tour isn't going away. Like, I think we can all agree on that. It's not going anywhere. So the question is, do you want to be in a constant battle with it or do you want to try and find a way to make it all work together? Jeff, I'm curious. Uh, you're, you're such a, a purist and you love everything about golf, but would you would you grumble about the draw at the Open sometimes? Or is, is that is – that, is Most that of the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've yeah. got a good draw. Um <laughs> It's part of it. It's part of the open. It's part of what its charm is, but it doesn't have to happen 40 times a year. There's room for different stuff, right? Correct. Um, I think the, the, there's an opportunity to make the big tournaments bigger by having a little bit of silliness soft at the side. I mean, not that it lives silly, but it's different. Um, the shotgun starts great. Like Trey says, when it's on a network, it might be different with the ads, but it, the, the shotgun start combined with the team thing like you see more golf in an hour on a live broadcast than you do in three hours on a normal tour broadcast. Right. They just share shot after shot after shot after shot after shot because there's not only interest in the winners. I mean, yesterday was um, – Boston was um, – there was a lot of guys in it and there's not always going to be a lot of guys in it coming down the stretch. But there's um, the team thing and the team thing is so volatile. It's so much more interesting than a stroke play event when a guy's six in front or five in front and nothing happens for the last four hours and you can come in and out every – half an hour and just check that he's still four in front. Um, the volatility to that team thing is really cool. Um, I'd go harder on the team thing. And, yeah. And I'd, I would drift away from individual golf a little bit and go harder on the team thing, I think. Um, there's plenty of room in 52 weeks a year to have both, you know. Um, and I think the team thing, it, it's got something going for it. I mean, I don't know if the way it's being played will get 
people will be buying jerseys and merchandise and like saying, oh, I'm a ball about this team or that team or DJ's team's going to win this week and all that. But I think if you if they push that a little bit harder, I think um, I think the team thing's got a lot of merit. I mean, look, the best two or well, at least the two of the most interesting tournaments in golf are the Ryder Cup and the President's Cup. Without question. Um, like Trey started at the start. It's like there's no reason you couldn't have a professional league match play. I mean, let's bring match play back a little bit. I mean, I just think there's room for both. Um, and I think – what we don't need 40 weeks a year with the same thing. I think if you actually had less of that, they would actually be more important. You know, that the real golfers are going to go win the open with the weird draw and the 12 hour gap between first and last tee time. And that's like Cam Smith, the bigger live player. Um, that's just the, the pinnacle of golf, but you don't need to try to match the pinnacle of golf every week because that's sort of undermining the pinnacle of golf. You know, I think there's room for everything. Well, and the team aspect can be even more compelling is that they're, they're already sort of unofficially grouping guys by nationality. So if you have an Aussie team, that's Cam Smith and Mark Leishman and, you know, a couple other guys, um, I, I think people in Australia are going to be more, they're going to care about it a little bit more and the silly names and stuff fall by the wayside. If, if they're, if they've got an Aussie, there are flag. some weird, there are some weird names. Let's just be honest. Oh, there, are yeah, weird, of course. there are some weird names. Yeah. There are some weird those names all- on the live tour. This is like the beta test. I mean, next yeah. year the teams are going to look. It's going to be very different. Different names, different Correct. branding, because they're going to be much more baked in, and it'll be for the whole year. Whereas they keep adding and subtracting parts this year, so it's all been a little wonky. But it'll be it'll be much more baked out next year, and without question, it, it's going to be. You're going to have a South African team, an Australian team, you're going to have a Latin American team. Um, you know, go on down the list. And I, I think there'll probably be an all English team. You know, I think that will just generate, it becomes essentially like the world cup, right. In some ways. And I, I think that becomes a natural South African team. I mean, there's, you can already see how it's getting organized. And I think that will, that will drive interest a little bit more because uh, you know, there's, there's tons of fans out there. They've, they've been cheering for Mark Leishman and Cam Smith forever. And I think they'll, they'll probably be okay transferring their allegiance more than they would if it was just an individualistic kind of pursuit. I mean, they would both help each other, wouldn't they? Like yeah. if if the, the the tour makes them famous and then live creates a different product to what I mean, they have a great tour season and then they go across to their team and it's like, well, we're excited because he had such a great season. Like, how good is this guy going to be in our team this year and stuff? I think, like Trey says, they got to work together because they're not going anywhere. To, they're not going anywhere. No, they're not going anywhere. And why, why not take advantage? I mean, there's, there's, an, there's advantages for both sides to sort of embrace the other side. Jeff, when you speak of that kind of scenario, do you envision of 30 weeks of PJ Tour and then 15 weeks of live or um, with the two intermingled or have one rent it and then go, go to the other tour? How would that play out in your mind? Well, I don't know. That's for smarter people than me. Um, Who's smarter than I you? Know. Come on. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I just know there's room for both. I know 40 weeks a year of 72 whole stroke play is boring. Um, like it's just too much. The ratings are awful. No one really, I mean, the tournament doesn't get interesting if it does get interesting until about an hour to go. Um, there's room. I don't know how it fits into the landscape. The majors need to stay where they are. I think the, that sort of, from a US sense, playing outside of football season makes the most sense. Um, and then I think the live, the live sort of the team concept would be better if it was all back to back to back or all in one point of the year, I would think. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I'd love to see the PGA Tour play January to the start of football or the end of August or something. And then everybody else just have at it, just come up with stuff that's fun, you know. Make it yeah, a real yeah, silly used, season. It, yeah, you're right. You used to start in Kapalua and then end in in September. Then we had the silly season, right? That's the way it used to be. But, and I think they're going back to that a little bit. There's still going to be those crossover uh, PGA Tour starter events, for lack of a better term, in the fall. But I think we're going to see that return to the calendar year season. I never understood the crossover season anyway. I was trying to figure out why they thought that was a good idea. The wraparound, also wrap around, sometimes referred yeah, to as exactly the reach around, but that's a whole other scenario. <laughs> that's a different. That's a different dynamic, really. A, that's a different podcast. That's a different <laughs> podcast. Um, so before we let we let you go, Trey, give give us a couple of of your favorite NFL stories. Uh, obviously, there's there's so many football fans who are listening here that 
they'd love to ask you, you know, the proverbial, oh, you're at a bar. They, yeah. they wander up to you. Trey, tell us one great NFL story for, from from the uh, from your years on, on the beat. Oh. You got any, any favorite ones? Yeah, there's a million of them. I mean, like, oh, I'm trying to think of the one I could I'll put you on the spot here. No, it's oh, it's good. It's, I'm trying to think of the one I can share and not get myself in trouble. Uh, oh, you can share that one. You can share that <laughs> for, one for, for lack sure. of a better term. You know, like there's a there's a million different things that go on. Like like for for example, I, one of the reasons I started the Half Forgotten History podcast is because of what we're talking about here, right? Like uh, there's a million stories that we talk about, whether we were at a Super Bowl week together or just in the green room that never made it on the air, and like. For, right, for example, I'll give you this one. Super Bowl 41, Peyton Manning finally beats Tom Brady in the AFC Championship game. And he knows his legacy is never going to be complete until he wins the Super Bowl. So this is pre-married Peyton. Married, he's just he's, – he's football. He's all football all the time. So the Colts are finally going to their first Super Bowl in the Peyton Manning era. And they have a big team meeting before they head down from Indianapolis to Miami for the week. And, you know, everybody's there. The players are there. The families are there. The kids are there. Everybody's – it's a big communal thing. And Peyton gets up there in front of everybody, in front of his players, their wives, their children, says, look, this is a freaking business trip. I don't want to have any kids running around the hall. We go, we're going to win the damn game. I don't want to be distracted by anything. And Jeff Saturday, who is his center and is his best friend on the team, his wife is holding his hand and crushing his hand as he's listening to Peyton say all this stuff. And Jeff's eyes get like this big. And he's like, dude. What are you doing? So after that whole meeting, Jeff went up to Peyton and said, you need to chill the F out or we're going to kill you. Okay? He, almost, he almost had a mutiny on his hands from his own teammates because he was so intense about what had to happen and didn't have to happen at the Super Bowl. He's like, I don't want any kids on my floor. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to hear any of that. Of course, now he's you know the father of the year. He's going to all his kids' flag football games and all this kind of stuff. But it was no part of his – background whatsoever they had to take him off the ledge before they got down there and they finally won the game 29 to 17 he was the mvp and peyton's legacy was secure but he almost lost the team before they even got to miami i love that i actually have a funny peyton story when when he went to the broncos i I was sent out by sports illustrated to write a story about it for his first game it turned out to be a cover story and the the poor uh, you know Broncos PR guy was overwhelmed by requests. Patrick and he Smith said to me, "Yes, Patrick, you're right." Patrick, he said to yeah. me, "You're not going to get any time with Peyton. I'm telling you right now, he's not doing any one on ones. Yeah. It's a crazy week." I said, "Okay, I understand." So I was just kind of hanging out and, and partaking in the scrums, but I'm one of them, and I almost never wear logos on my clothes. I'm kind of anti logo, but uh, I had a Pebble Beach pullover, and he looked at it and he said. Uh, You've ever played Pebble Beach? I said, Yeah, I worked there for three summers actually. And he's like, Do you know so and so? He said, Do you know RJ Harper? I said, Yeah. He was the guy who hired me. He was the head pro. And we had we had this little moment. And then so after the game, um, I just waited it out, and he was getting hustled out of there. And he's like, Hey, Pebble. I was like, hey, can I ask a couple quick questions? And he's like, yeah, of course. And we stood and we talked for like seven minutes, which is a long time really Absolutely. in that context. Yeah. And and yeah, poor Patrick. I mean, he was giving me the stink guy the entire, the entire time. time. Like I've, yeah. I've rarely had daggers thrown at me that way. And But those seven minutes made my whole story. And it was all because of you know the Pebble Beach connection. You know, Peyton, he's got buddies out here. I think he might be one of the, the investors of the company, certainly an investor in um, – Sweetens Cove, like he loves golf. So, oh, yeah. it, as we were saying at the top, it is a universal language, and that was yep. like a crucial little, little uh, exchange. By any means talk. necessary, Alan. By any means necessary. I know. And it was honestly an accident. Yeah. So. Did you ever try the tactic again? Do you ever put the pebble beach thing on the morning? I need Target today. I've got to put the pebble thing. On. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't take me anywhere with Tiger. Strangely, yeah. this isn't going to top your Peyton story, but it's in the it's in the same vein. Um, I was writing about Nicholas and, uh, and, and Nicholas was playing in the Jamboree, uh, the uh, member member event at, uh, at Augusta and his partner was a new member, Peyton Manning. And, uh, so then, you know, Peyton's, and then, as you said, Peyton's an investor in Sweden's Cove. So I would mention Peyton Manning. So Peyton Manning has worked in my stories various times. And, uh, so Peyton sees me at Augusta and he, you know, is one of these. He says, I've noticed every time uh, you, you write my name, it goes like this, Peyton Manning, comma, a member of Augusta National, comma. He says, I'm going to make you a deal. 
I'm going to give you an interview whenever you want if you agree to sometimes not write Peyton Manning, comma, a member of Augusta National. <laughs> and I don't consider I don't consider this story a violation of the terms of the deal because it's verbal and not written. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's cool that he's reading the stories. Like, you got to yeah. love that because yeah. um, he's a great guy. Uh, no, he really is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he loves the game. Some of this, he loves the game. Some of you might be listening to this podcast. There's uh, our colleague Matt Janella did did an, a really fun two part podcast about the mother of all of golf buddies trips around the the Open Championship at St Andrews that Peyton and uh, his brothers were part of. And it's a great listen. I would encourage you to check it out. It'll give you a lot of insight into Peyton and his whole crew. And, um, but anyway, that, what else do you have, Trey? Give us one more and then you're out of here. Oh, you put me on the spot. Um, I know, but you like pressure. You're I do. I do. I do. Uh, I'm trying to think, um, or I like, this is sort of off the beaten path, but, uh, <laughs> it's Super Bowl 42. The Patriots are trying to beat the, uh, trying to, you know, trying to pull off the perfect season. They ended up losing to the Giants. Well, if you do post game at a Super Bowl, like halfway through the fourth quarter, and I was doing post game that year, they heard you all down to go down on the field, you know, in one wave at a time altogether. But you can't watch the game. So I am now traveling to go watch the end of the game to find out what happens, and I can't see the game. So I called my friend Mark Schlereth, who uh, I still work with on a lot of platforms now. I said, Mark, you you got to walk me through what's happening in the fourth quarter. This is the drive where, you know, Eli leads into the game-winning touchdown with like 37 seconds to play. So I'm like, what's happening? He's like, uh, well, okay, uh, uh, the Giants had the ball, and uh, it looks like you're in a three-man over protection scheme. I'm like, Mark, because Mark's a former offensive lineman. I was like, shut up. I don't want to tell about the blocking scheme. Look at the ball, follow the ball, and tell me what happens. He goes, oh, okay, got it. Got it. Uh, Eli <laughs> drops back, uh, almost gets sacked. Completion over the middle, uh, first down. Great. <clears throat> and then I'm like, Mark, I'm inside the stadium now. I can see everything. It's great. Fine. So I, I see Plexico Burris catch the game-winning touchdown pass. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I go on a beeline to run, talk to him. And I realize I'm the only guy around Plexico Burris. And there's a million people <clears throat> around this guy, David Tyree. I'm like, <clears throat> losing my voice here. David Tyree's a special teams player. Like, <clears throat> why are you talking to him? The play where Mark said, Eli runs around, voids a sack. That was the helmet catch. And he never said, he never said he caught it with his helmet. He said, ah, first down. I'm like, dude, you are the worst analyst ever. Like, you're really good at watching the game, but don't ever, ever do play by play. Because you just screwed me out of the biggest interview I ever could have needed. <laughs> Poor Plexica. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I don't I think that interview it. ever saw air. Never. I was the only one. At all. <laughs> Why am I the only one talking to the guy that got the touchdown to beat the Patriots? There's a million guys around that scrub, David Tyree. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Um, well, uh, Trey, thank you for doing this. It's absolute pleasure. Yeah, um, no worries, man. I love to, uh, it's great to connect with like the hardcore golf fan. It's, it's a, it's a tremendous perspective. So, I, could, I couldn't quit uh, the game if I tried and I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have at some point, probably not Michael, but, uh, me, me and Jeff perhaps, um, every day I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and then every day you start over. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, um, Hit the little red button there, Trey. We're gonna we're gonna do you a little Monday it. morning quarterbacking on your on your performance. So that's something you can look forward to at the end of the podcast. Oh right? yeah, I'll really <laughs> look forward to that. Just want you to know, I'll be real excited about that. I can't wait. All right, guys. Yeah, it, was, it was it was great fun. Thank you. You got it, guys. Thanks, Take Trey. it easy, Jeff. Always a pleasure, man. Good to see you, Michael. Thanks, man. You know, as you were saying, Michael, it, it's amazing how carefully some of the the quote unquote fans follow the sport. That Scottish Open thing was freaky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but his I mean, his insights are really, really good. He knows golf and he knows sport. Jeff, did you follow NFL football closely in your American years? Yeah, when I arrived, I didn't get it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it just – you can't avoid it. I've worked out pretty early on. If I want to talk to any of my peers between about the 1st of August and – 
February. I got better better learn how to talk about football and no one wants to talk <laughs> about anything else. Um, so I started watching it. I loved it. I mean, yeah, I ended up, I mean, college, pros, the whole thing, loved it. Played with a bunch of footballers, lucky enough. I mean, Larry Fitzgerald might be the most enthusiastic golfer in America. Um, <laughs> good, great Scottsdale Phoenix guy. He was always around. As I said, I used to play with DA a lot. Um, play with Romo a bit. I mean, they're fantastic. Uh, just, just, just outrageous athletes. I mean, we talk about some athletes in golf. Those footballers are just on a whole another stratosphere. They're not built normal. And just to be around guys like that, I think is really cool. Um, so talented. I mean, most people take a lifetime to learn how to hit what they're working out in about a week. You know, um, pretty cool. So yeah, and it's such a perfect, isn't it a perfect TV sport? I mean, we talk about golf and I said, it's incredible. And the last Sunday of the Masters or the Ryder Cup or there's some moments in normal tournaments that are compelling viewing. But I mean, an NFL game has you ha- captured from the first minute till the end and it gives you plenty of time to go to the toilet, plenty of time to go get a beer, get a snack. It's just like the perfect TV product, right? I mean, it's just so well put together. Um, you can't help but like it. I think if you watch a few games, you just can't help but like it because it's just such a good it's such a good product. Well, that there's that George Will line about football. He says it combines two of the worst elements of American life: violence followed by committee meetings. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, the, the 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 huddles in between the plays. It's a little bit. It's akin to me to like walking between shots, right? There's so there's this little buildup. You know, it's these little thirty second buildups between every play, and it's just enough time to think about what might happen. And the announcers are. They're speculating and you're getting replays. And it, if it was longer, it'd be too long. And if it was shorter, there wouldn't be the same anticipation. So somehow it works, even though there, there's, in essence, a lot of dead time. But uh, that's just part of the viewing experience, I guess. But um, you said you said you had to you had to get into football. But what about hunting and fishing? That, what, wouldn't that have <laughs> provided plenty of fodder for your tour conversations? Well, yeah. I mean, I I used to fish a little bit growing up in melbourne but fishing i mean i like fishing whenever it's presented to me i have a good time but it's usually about who you're with and what's in the cooler i think more often um hunting no that's not my deal i mean um it's less i think it's less hunting and fishing used to be there's a a sort of a section of the locker room on tour that's hunters and fishers but football is universal you know um Football and golf are universal. So, yeah, fishing a little bit, no hunting, certainly football. No, that was good. It's not golf course architecture conversations. I know that. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm sure that's true. Jeff, at what point in your developing sophistication did you start calling Colt Harry? (laughs) It's always been Harry Colt, no? I didn't know that. Henry S. Colt was how I knew him. Henry. H.S. Colt. Um, that's cool. One of my great friends, Kevin Price, we've been we've been thinking about an, an England trip for a long time. And it's incredible how many how many great courses there are in that heathland around London. And then you get down to the coast. I mean, everyone talks about Scotland and Ireland, but pound for pound, there might be more great golf courses in England than than either of the other two. Jeff, um, have you ever played uh, Royal Singports? I've played Royal Singports, yeah. I mean, England is great. Um the, the links, I think, I mean, if you're going to just play pure coastal courses, you'd probably go to Scotland. Um, but the Heathland courses, in the inland courses in England might be some of the best. Um, fantastic. I mean, the coastal ones are great too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Singports is great. Um, Birkdale. That, oh, man. Birkdale's great. I mean, live them, I mean oh, the, the list goes on. And that area down near Singports, you've got Rye and Hastings and um, St. George's. Fantastic little pockets. Um, of golf, but I love that that sort of Heathland golf, Surrey, west of London, Sunningdale, the Berkshires, Winley Forests, and George's Hill. I mean, these places are as good as golf. They're, they're as pleasant an experience as golf can provide. Just incredible. I love it. All right. Well, we're going to bring this uh, Nita Fourth to a close. Uh, it's always it's always good fun. You never know who's going to wind up on this podcast. We will be. Um, back at it again. Uh, thanks as always for listening and uh, more surprises await. Uh, I'm Alan Shipnuck. That's Jeff Ogilvie and Michael Bamberger. And this is Nita Fourth. Uh, this is the end. Thanks. <laughs>